life, and I was coming out of this long-standing first career, and everything I read was about winding down, and I wanted to do just the opposite. I wanted to wind up and do lots of other new things, and new second acts in lots of different ways, lifelong learning, you know, different pursuits. Um, and so I was, as I was out there, there wasn't a lot written about this. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of it was downbeat. So I wanted to blow that up and really, um, and hence the book was, the book idea was born. Welcome to Second Act Stories. Every two weeks, we bring you a new story about people who've made major life and career changes and are pursuing more rewarding lives in a second act. I'm today's host, Andy Levine. And I'm Andy's co-host today, Scott Merritt. So Andy, every now and then we feature an expert interview, and uh, today's episode features an expert interview with an author named Michael Clinton. What's Michael's background? He's got a really interesting background, Scott. So he's had a long career in publishing, finishing up as president and publishing director of Hearst Magazines. He's a marathon runner, a serious mar marathon runner. He's run on seven different continents. He's an accomplished photographer, he's a writer, and he's a private pilot. And it sounds like he's one of the more accomplished people that I've ever heard either of us talking to. He's had an interesting life. He has written a book called Roar into the Second Half of Your Life, and he is building the Roar Forward community with Hearst Publishing. Here's my interview with Michael Clinton. I'd like to start just with a little about your own background. From what I gather, you grew up in Pittsburgh, sort of humble beginnings, and maybe you can just give us a little taste of that. Yeah, thanks. I, d I did grow up in Pittsburgh, working class kid, one of six kids, uh, oldest of six kids. Um, my dad was a laborer. My mother was a housewife. There was really no real education in the family history on both sides. So I was the first one to graduate from college in the family. And subsequently, my other siblings did and so forth. But it was pretty, uh, it was pretty tough. It was a pretty tough uh, upbringing. Fortunately, we always had food and we always had heat, but um, there weren't a lot of other extras. So yeah, I came from a really, um, a very simple, simple place. You've built a really impressive career in the world of publishing, 40 years at the highest ranks of Condé Nast, Hertz Publishing. I know this is kind of a tall order, but can you summarize that 40-year career yeah. in maybe uh, a minute or so? Well, let's start with I came to New York with $60 in my pocket, a college degree, no contacts, and a, and a couch to sleep on for two, two months. That was my, my time frame. And um, there was a recession going on, so it was hard to get a job. But I'll cut to the chase. I ultimately got my first job as a reporter and journalist for Fairchild Publications, which is a B2B company. And it's the good old-fashioned story. You know, I started from the ground up and just found my way, became the publisher of GQ, which was a great, fun job, was the senior VP and executive vice president of Condé Nast, overseeing some of the publishing sides of Vanity Fair and Vogue and Arc Digest, moved over to Hearst, uh, been here 25 years, um, and uh, helped was on the team that launched Oprah's Magazine and Food Network Magazine and bought a couple of companies with others. And yeah, got to the pinnacle of being the president and publishing director of the magazine company. Amazing. Yeah. Um, take us to the origins of the book Roar. Uh, when did you start to put together the concept that you describe in this book? Well, it actually started with a sort of a last lecture to my whole management team here at Hearst. I wanted to leave them some thoughts and wisdom, so I did sort of a 12-minute, call it mini TED Talk, about, um, it was actually a ROAR talk. It was an acronym, the ROAR acronym, which is uh, reimagine yourself, own, own your stuff, uh, act, what's your action plan, and reassess your relationships. It was really more in a professional context for them. Here's a brief snippet from Michael's presentation to his team. But you know, the life progress that we've all known is becoming more and more obsolete because you're gonna have multiple careers, different lifestyles, maybe multiple loves in your life. And so that's something to think about and embrace. You may decide to retire, I hate that word, from the first career, and I love the word rewire, into a new career that you have for 20 years. And then you may have a third career for another 20 years. The idea of age appropriate is going to go away. It's an old paradigm. 
because you might become a parent at 50, you might go back to school at 60, you might find a new love at 70 or 80 or even 90. So the construct that we've known in life cycles is changing all around us because we're living longer and having a very dynamic and vibrant second half. The presentation was a great success and it inspired him to turn his talk into a book. I was coming out of this long-standing first career and everything I read was about winding down and I wanted to do just the opposite. I wanted to wind up and do lots of other new things, new second acts in lots of different ways, lifelong learning, you know, different pursuits. Um, and so I was, as I was out there, there wasn't a lot written about this. A lot of it was downbeat. So I wanted to blow that up and really, um, and hence the book was, the book idea was born. So the term roar, I mean, did that come to you as you were preparing to do this last lecture? It had been in your mind for months or, you know, did it come rather quickly? I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious how that came to so, you. So my, my best thinking is when I'm out having a run, um, my, my you too. might, you <laughs> might, you might relate since you're a marathon runner like myself, we have that shared interest. Um, so I do my best thinking when I'm out running. So I was literally, literally out in Central Park. And I think when you're doing something like what I was thinking about the last lecture, you have to keep it simple. And I always believe that people can digest three things or people can digest something that's placed in an acronym form. Mm -hmm. And ROAR was such a strong word and it has such great, you know, forward motion to it that I just really loved the word. And so it kind of came to me just out of my own brain as I was out having a run. Fantastic. So I do want to go through these four steps with you one by one. Uh, I think it's really interesting the way you've positioned this here, but... Reimagine yourself as number one. Just give us yeah. a word about, about yeah. each of these. So we'll start I, with that. The, the, the first R is integrating the reimagination, reimagineering process into your everyday life. We have wellness and nutrition and yoga or mindfulness or whatever. Really thinking daily about how do you reimagine your own future? What is your favorite future? Pick an area. It doesn't have to be everything in your life, but there's something that everybody has that's one area where they're saying, I need to evolve, I need to grow, whether it's in career, work, uh, lifestyle, health and fitness, relationship, pick the one thing and use the reimagination process as your daily, your daily mantra. And you can multitask, you can do it while you're working out, you can do it while you're driving the kids, coming back from driving the kids to, to school. There, there are lots of different ways you can integrate it into your day. Or you can have 15 minutes of private time and just sit there and think about it and journalize it and stuff like that. So it's a way of thinking and a way of, of living. Journaling is interesting. Do you think that's an important uh, tactic or tool to get to reimagining yourself? Yeah, so I'm a publisher, so I believe in the written word and writing <laughs> things down. Um, <laughs> also, there's a lot of work in neuroscience that when you write something down and you read it, interestingly enough, mostly on paper, you have higher levels of retention mm -hmm. about it, and you have higher levels of, because our brains have been wired for hundreds of years to read things on physical paper. So I like the idea of journaling, which I do every January, my year-long journal, and I check on it the first Saturday of every month to see if I'm making progress and what I want to do for that particular year to build on the my, my life experience. So yeah. I want to go to the O. Yeah. Own who you are, and particularly I like the phrase own your numbers, which was interesting yeah. to me. Yeah, well owning your numbers is a combination of numbers. It's, you know, if you're going to live to be 90 or maybe even 100, <clears throat> what you need to do is make sure you're healthy and also make sure you're financially sound because how are you going to finance a life to 90 plus? And so the fundamentals of health, it's a cliche, but it's amazing to me how many 50-year-olds I speak to who don't know their blood pressure, have not had a colonoscopy, do not know their heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. And those things are just really fundamental. There's so much in the medical world that's preventative now to keep us long, long living and, and healthy. So knowing your numbers, your health numbers, your wealth numbers, also owning your age and being proud of it. I think having people say, this is what the new 60 looks like. You know, 60 is not the new 40, 60 is the new 60. Mm -hmm. So own your age. And also own that you're going to have a last number because we're all going to leave the earth, whether the you believe it or not. Number. The final number, <laughs> you got to own it. And, you know, what's your, what's your legacy? What do you want to leave behind? 
So that's the own it section. Moving on to A, yeah. act on what's next. I particularly was interested in this concept of life layering. Yeah, so it's my favorite. So who are you and how do you start layering in other personas to your life? So my own personal example was when I was, when I turned 40, I wanted to tap into my adventure gene and I went and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro with a group of friends and now over several up to owning my age, I'm 69. So owning my age for now 29 years, I have done an enormous amount of adventure traveling. I've run marathons on every continent. I turned 60. I ran a marathon in Antarctica. I've climbed mountains in Nepal and Patagonia and Bhutan, chased lemurs in Madagascar, on and on. So my layer for me is I'm an adventure traveler and it's a cumulative thing. So think about what layer you create for yourself and then keep adding other layers to it. And the book gives a lot of great ways to to do that. Other layers you've added since then, I know, for example, I I read philanthropy is one that you have layered in. Um, You mentioned photography, but but just adding in different things. Yeah, so I like to say you have a big, delicious layer cake. So when someone asks me, what do you do? I don't talk about what I did for a living I don't talk about my other roles. What I talk about are my layers. So I'm an adventure traveler. I'm a photographer. I've had eight books of my photography published. I'm a philanthropist. I'm on multiple boards and have my own foundation. I just finished uh, a master's degree at Columbia in nonprofit uh, philanthropy, lifelong learning. And so Building that layer cake is real. And, and, and by the way, you can start it at any time in life. You can start it at 25 or you can start it at 80. There's always another dimension to build a new layer around your own persona. The final letter, R, for reassess your relationships. Talk through that one for yeah, us. So, so when you're ready to reimagine, to make a change, to move careers, to start a second career, to do anything in your life, you need your, your posse of people around you who support you. And by the time you get to midlife, your, your, your family, your friends that you have, step back and do a people audit. Um, we all know this, that story about your college friend that you met when you were 20 and they're still kind of in your life at 50, but are they really, is, is it, has, that, has that grown? Has that partnership, re- relationship grown rather? Or are they sort of a toxic part of your life? Are they, you know, not supportive of you really? Or are they jealous? Or, you know, do that assessment because you can meet great people at all times in your life and you've got to get the people who are on your team and on your vibe to be able to help you. Your, your relationships are really what facilitate how you want to evolve and change. And um, that's includes, that includes your spouse and your kids, and that includes your parents and your si- siblings. And sometimes it's hard decisions to move away from the negativity, but you have to do it if that's in your life with people to really focus on those who are supportive of you. So that's the R, the final R of Roar. So you've interviewed in your book 40 reimagineers is the term, which is a brilliant term. I really like yeah, it. Thank you. What are the two to three common traits that you found among this group in terms of being successful in reimagining their life? So the reimagineers are the archetypes of what I call the new longevity. They are the ones who kind of have blown through the stereotypes of what we're supposed to do. One woman was a 53-year-old writer and editor, and she decided to become a medical doctor. And she tells her story how she became a medical doctor at 60, and then said, I'll spend 20 plus years contributing as a medical doctor. That's a big agenda to make that decision at 53, as, as you can imagine. There's a lot of schooling involved in A lot that of schooling, change. like back to school to get basics like chemistry and biology and all that stuff before she even took the MCATs. So lots of, of interesting stories. But I think if the things that, that I would say were, were common threads, um, high levels of curiosity, high levels of optimism and positivity about I can do this, not getting bogged down by the term age appropriate, but really person appropriate, Mm -hmm. Um, shedding themselves of things like retire and thinking about rewire, which is another concept. Um, They had definitely a can-do attitude. Um, They all spent, I would say, a good year to two figuring out their reimagineer 
steps. So this is not something that happens over a weekend. This is a process. And they sort of got everything in place before they put the plan in place to make the choices that they that they made. So I'm going to guess you've probably not gotten this question yet. I know you've done dozens and dozens of interviews, but one of the things we found in Second Act Stories, and we've interviewed, as I told you, 128 different people, about 80% of the people we interview are in the planner category, which I think is what you're describing. About 20% are in the leaper category. They don't think it through. They uh, quit a job and they right. just jump into something new. Right. Uh, does that run a little bit counter to what you're finding among the group you've you've interviewed no, the, I, the I, leapers? I, I think there there weren't a lot of leapers mm-hmm. in this. Uh, some of them, life kind of smacked them around. There was a guy who lost his company. His wife left him. He acknowledged he was an alcoholic. So, so all sorts of trauma. So all sorts of trauma, and they had to find a path. Um, sometimes life throws you curveballs. Sometimes you're you're more in control. But I would say most of them, I would say all of them, actually didn't knee jerk react. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. really thought this through in terms of what they wanted to change, how they wanted to reimagine, and they picked their lane and went at it. There was one woman who decided to do it all, to do everything. She was going to have a year of change, work relationships, fitness and health, et cetera. Um, she has four kids, a set of triplets as well, who were all sort of grown up now. Wow. And she was like, she was divorced. And she's like, I'm going to change my career. I'm going to sell the house that I raised my kids in. I'm going to find a new partner, which she did. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get fit and healthy. You know, she took it all on. I don't know if I'd recommend that because oh, that's, okay. a, that's a big order. But... Um, she did it. She did it all. And I read about her in the book. She's quite amazing. For those that don't make the leap, they stay in a job they hate or in a relationship maybe that isn't working for them. What do you think are the major barriers to change for that group? Well, it's all, it's all a headset. It's all a mindset. We, we actually talk about this in the book and we give people some tools that they can use to get unstuck because a lot of people are stuck or say, I don't know what I want to do, or I don't know what step I want to take. So we have them go through a few little um, processes. One of them, I'm simplifying what it is, but it's go back to your younger self. What was it in your 20s, your early 20s, that you were really passionate about, that you may have left on the shelf? We all have something we left on the shelf because life took us to it on different paths. We Maybe we were um, in college and wanted to be an anthropologist, and our parents said, well, that's not a really practical choice. Why don't you become an accountant? You'll get a job. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with being an accountant, by the way, but your real passion was to be an anthropologist. Now, you may not want to go back and get a PhD in anthropology. I'm not suggesting that. But how do you pick up that thread and figure out how you get into that world somehow. There's all different avenues you can take to align yourself into sort of an anthropology circle, if you will. The people who've done that have found found it to be very rewarding, uh, going back to their younger self and reclaiming something. You mentioned earlier that this sort of came out of this this, uh, life lesson talk you gave before your staff. What kind of impact is the book having now, and what are you what are you seeing out there? Well, the book's it's been a great blessing. We're in our third printing. We Fantastic. had a lot of interest. We had have had one point three billion media impressions all over the media, U.S. and abroad. I think that that a lot of people are at this place, especially in a post pandemic world, where they're saying. Okay, that was existential, what we all went through. Am I living the life that I want to live? Am I doing the things I want to do? Am I with the person I want to be with? Am I living in the city I want to live in? I think we had a lot of introspection that we all had, and I think people are reassessing and making choices. So I think we we sort of hit on the zeitgeist of the moment with that, with the book. Um, We're now turning the book into seminars and workshops and... Um, different different activities through a company we're launching called Roar Forward. Um, and so we're going to build it out so that it has a longer, longer life than just, just the book itself. Mm-hmm. 
For Second Act Stories, we've interviewed a little over a dozen experts, a mix of career coaches, journalists, and authors. Michael Clinton comes with a different perspective. He was a highly successful executive, and as he was planning to leave his first career in publishing, he couldn't find an inspiring roadmap for what comes next. So he created his own roadmap and came up with ROAR. One more time, here's what ROAR stands for. R, reimagine yourself. O, own who you are. A, act on what's next. R, reassess your relationships. You can learn more about Michael and the ROAR community at www.roarbymichaelclinton.com. We'll be adding his book to our best books about second acts list, and we hope you'll check it out. That's it for today. We hope you'll keep listening. There are more second act stories just around the corner. 